All right. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Wednesday live chat, the chat, as it were. A uh, big thank you to anybody taking the time to rewatch this as we go later on. And yeah, tonight, I'm hoping we can chat about Mr. Derek Axton, who is a fellow Canadian. So yay for those of us trying to make a go of this farming thing in the cold. Um, but most importantly, he's kind of trying to rebuild his soil using, well, living roots and uh, the joy of cover crops, things of that nature. Oh, nice to see somebody has joined us. Thank you for uh, joining us. As some of my viewers have pointed out, cover crops are uh, particularly complicated in a lot of areas, particularly areas where there is a, a really short season. Um, howdy, Eric. Nice to see you. Um, well, you're the one in particular in that conversation going off about uh, short seasons and how complicated that could be for, for cover crops. Did you by any chance get the opportunity to watch the Derek Axton video that I linked up on Thursday's video? <laughs> Quite an interesting speaker. Quite nervous in that uh, that one particular video that I did link. But it is quite difficult if you're to speaking to a camera, speaking to audiences or whatever. So I can totally see uh, why a fellow would be nervous. I think you did. Excellent. Excellent. Um, one of the things, like there are a couple of things that he's doing to try and rebuild his soil that I find quite fascinating. He's doing a lot of interesting stuff with compost and compost teas and kind of putting that in under the seed with his seed drill situation. That's kind of interesting. I'd, I'd like to know more about that in the long-term future, but uh, short-term, I'm really interested in what he's doing with intercropping and relay seeds, like relay cropping. He's He seems to be trying to uh, get one thing to harvest out and then, you know, follow up and either harvest the second thing or it's growing just throughout the winter or whatever, trying to get some biological activity going and staying active in that soil that he's got there so he's been doing a lot of stuff with growing different things together hence intercropping crops intermixed with each other i guess what was it chickpeas chickpeas and lentil chickpeas and flax i think he was saying were the real home run there and he's doing a lot of um seed sorting and such like the focus on his farm seems to be well continuing his personal research while well, his wife seems to be very interested in it as well but their focus for, for revenue seems to be uh, seed sales he says he's gotten into pedigree seed sales i don't know how that's different from regular seed sales but still it means he is going to be wanting to grow a quality crop and uh, whatever he's got going for his seed sorting technique better be pretty accurate. So one hopes that is profitable for him. One assumes that is profitable for him. He's uh, talking about testing some of these theories on uh, one of his interspace interplanting theories. He tests on like 1500 acres, which is just ridiculous. Another one he tests on like 450 Another got tested, uh, or was it accidental? Was it lentils and mustard on 600 acres? Very interesting. Yes, watched him now after you said about the peas and the lentils. Yeah, um, thought it was quite interesting what he was saying too about a lot of the peas and stuff that he's growing now um, would generally be considered kind of hard to grow, hard to harvest, really, I guess, because their tendency to like flop onto the ground. But because he's growing them with flax and other different things that they can trellis up, it kind of changes the structure of the plant a little bit. And uh, therefore his peas are growing up much easier to harvest. And he's talking about growing cow peas and forage peas and all kinds of different, I didn't even know there were that many different kinds of peas. And lentils, I didn't know uh, there was but two different kinds of lentils. So I may have to check larger grocery stores to see what kind of options are out there. But my main passion is is livestock. So for me, keeping a living root in the ground is going to be, well, it's going to be as easy as making sure my pasture is still alive, right? 
But for people trying to grow crops, um, and, and small grain crops really seem to be kind of, I don't know, problematic from, from what I'm seeing and hearing. Um, it's really good to be able to consider mixing it up and still being able to divide them if you want a, a proper divided seed harvest kind of crop. Like again, with the case of the mustards and the lentils, you know, I think he said he got a super B load of mustard seed out of that. Now, I don't really know what a super B load is. I'm thinking it's one of the two trailer setups going behind a big rig on the highway. So, you know, out of 600 and some odd acres, that doesn't sound like a huge return. But in that case, I mean, he was saying it's because there was a herbicide problem. So the mustard just kind of grew back on its own um, in amongst the lentils. So, I mean, that's that's interesting. And if he had been planting it intentionally, might have done better. Apparently that was oh fly. Apparently that was a good year for mustard price. So, you know, that's all well and good there. But um, yeah, I see a lot of monocrops out here. And they all seem to need boosts and bonuses and stuff and sprays for this and sprays for the other thing. And I hear a lot of these people talk about biodiversity under the soil and, you know, biodiversity growing in the soil and, and how that helps prevent pest problems and how that helps improve overall um, yield. You know, like there's that gainer, Jaeger. Yeah, I keep wanting to call it the Jaeger experiment, but I know that's not it. Jaeger, Jaeger, something experiment in Germany where they've got uh, one, two, four, eight, all kinds of different crops set up. And, you know, they've discovered that basically eight crop types in one little field with no nitrogen will produce as much or more than one or two types of crops with 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So, I mean, that's pretty, pretty crazy. There's something to be said for diversity. You got a seed separator to separate the different seeds. Well, yeah, you'd, you'd have to, right? Um, but in the case of like Gabe Brown, who is one of my examples of putting it all together. So we're kind of jumping the, jumping the line here. But he harvests all of his small grains together, doesn't bother to sort them out. And he feeds them as a ration to some of his animals. So, you know, if you're looking to sell it, then yeah, you're going to need to separate it unless you're like looking to sell it as, as a feed. But in Gabe's case, you know, he's found a way to utilize the cropland as cropland. He's still grazing his animals across it and, um, yeah, feeding still other animals from uh, the small grains that it produces. So that's pretty impressive. Again, though, it's not really, not really something I personally am all that interested in, um, I mean, a lot of people, I suppose, want to get out there and drive them big old tractors and drive them big old combines. But, <clears throat> excuse me, ultimately, my dream has been to have enough land. I need a horse to walk around the fence line every day so I can check the fence line in a reasonable amount of time. And that is not a tractor. That's a horse. That, that's another animal because I like animals. I like caring for animals. And, uh, yeah, my long-term property goal is to just... just keep moving my livestock around, keep improving the land, keep improving the livestock, adding to the livestock and maybe even adding to the land as things go on. You know, it's for me, I think it'll be pretty straightforward because it's kind of like a hobby. And when that hobby gets to a point where it doesn't like it can replace my job, then it will replace my job. But until then, it's just going to be something that I kind of do and learn about. And uh, I'm really excited about that. I think it's got to be hell for people that are like farming is their only source of, of income. And then, you know, they're looking at the, well, I can get a better yield if I put more money in with this input or that input, or if I get this spray or that fungicide or whatever. And, you know, it becomes really easy to get wrapped up in the trying to get that bigger yield because you think that bigger yield equals a bigger paycheck and it becomes easy to forget just all those little bits of money you spend up to that point. But to some extent, it's almost like winning the lotto, right? Like if you spend $50 a week on scratch and win tickets, but you won $500 on one scratch and win ticket, did you really win 
anything. If you spent 10 weeks doing it at $50 a week, you broke even. Not really winning anything, right? But people get caught up in the win. And I think yields are very much like that scratch and win win or like the you know roulette wheel win 32 to one hey you gotta like that but if you lost 40 times to get there that's a loss and uh yeah that that is not something that i would be excited about and i think that is part of why i'm definitely gonna keep my focus on livestock building diversity in the land absolutely you know planting different things in there sure if I've got ridiculous amounts of extra grass growing, I may bale some up for hay for personal use, but I'm not going to buy the equipment to do that. I'll have, I'll find somebody, a custom cutter or somebody to come in and do it for me. Or, you know, I'll just keep it as standing stock and custom graze because why not get paid to babysit somebody else's animals, you know, trying to fatten up some lambs, trying to fatten up some beeves. I got acres that need a chew and bring them on down. Not quite sure how that works, but uh, Greg Judy goes off about it in, in some detail. So the information's out there. And there are people locally that are advertising that they have grass available for the 2020 season for custom grazing. So people are doing it. Just need to get started, really. But first, I need land, and then I need to see how much grass that land's going to grow. And it's all quite interesting. But I am, I am very much interested in helping out grain farmers because they're they're doing a big job uh, globally speaking. You get a scythe to make my own hay. Well, I could. That sounds rather more labor intensive than I'd like. I've got the riding mower if it really comes down to it, and you know I'll just blast it in circles and get that pile in the middle, rake it up, let it dry. Uh, not a great quality of hay that way. <clears throat> Excuse me, frog in my throat tonight. Not a great quality of hay that way, but yeah, eh, anything is possible. And I am cheap, so. But most likely, if it comes down to needing to cut it for hay, which is going to be pretty unlikely, I think. But if it does come down to it, then I know people who have hay cutting equipment and livestock so i could probably make some sort of arrangement look come cut it for me take half of what you cut it's all it's all good it's my uh, token of appreciation you know if there's enough it needs to be cut one assumes there's going to be a fair amount of dry matter in that hay so in theory it should work out towards somebody's best interest i don't know might have to actually pay them cash for it too it's a cash run world Nothing new there. But the idea of um, intercropping, getting back to Derek Axton there, intercropping, relay cropping, cover cropping, to keep that living root in the soil. I mean, and it is, when it comes to building soil health, a big part of it is about keeping living root in there because that's, that's where you're getting your root exudates from. And your root exudates are your carbon and your sugars and all of those things that feed the biology and that's what feeds the plants and it's all this big circle right so if that all starts with living roots it kind of ends when you desiccate your crop and cut her down and end up like the north field just on the other side of the fence there it's got stubble so at least it wasn't completely stripped and it is some of the snow is being held on there. So they are being able to, you know, as Derek says, uh, with the way he does the strip cutting, harvest the snow that would normally blow off and um, fill up the little gullies in between the hills. Because the prairies aren't as flat as people living in the mountains might, I think. <laughs> there are, in fact, a lot of little rolling dips and bumps and, and such. And those tend to fill up with the snow as the wind rips across the tops of those hills. But with the stubble that's out there in the, in the north field, and like Derek cuts his fields there too, um, it does, it gets caught and it all seems to melt a little more evenly as the sun shines on it. And you actually, when you actually get above freezing temperatures, it eh, melts it down a little bit. And if you are running animals, then great. You know, when they can see the stubble sticking out above the, the snow, they're going to be able to mow it down just a little bit easier. So, 
like in Derek's case there, apparently he doesn't run animals. So he got together with a neighbor who has a whole bunch of cattle and they kind of turn them out into his field for the winter time. So he's getting the animal activity and the, the action of the hoof and the action of the dung and the urine and the saliva and all of that stuff, building up the biology in his field. So, you know, he's trying to follow basically the five principles there that, uh, most of these regenerative agriculture folks are are driving at but at the same time he doesn't seem terribly worried about it and that's almost nice because when you really worry about following rules it really it guides your thinking and sometimes it becomes a little harder to think outside of the box because you're you're restricted. Oh, well, I'd like to do this, but it, it doesn't necessarily comply with rule one, five or nine or however many rules you happen to be following in that case. Right. You know, in this case, five, five simple. But if your idea is in conflict with any one of those five things, then you're inclined to not try it because, well, you're not following the rules. But at the same time, you could be missing out on learning something because you were afraid to try it. So yeah, I appreciate the fact that he's not entirely bound to those, those guidelines, but at the same time, still, still working towards it. I mean, I think what he's doing with uh, the compost and I think he said their goal is to inoculate his fields with two tons of compost per acre, which sounds like a massive composting operation to me. But at the same time, when they're separating all their seeds, there's some, I think he said 300 tons of just kind of waste product that comes out of that, which has got to be leaves and stems. And I guess, I don't know, maybe broken seeds. I don't know what comes out of the waste end of a seed sorting such situation. But, you know, they found a way to use that on their farm and they're mixing it all up and composting it down and spreading it out in the soil and feeding the bacteria that way. One thing I found interesting about um, Mr. Axton, too, is he puts that little bit of molasses in when they put their compost tea in with the seeds so that as the plant is germinating, the biology has those sugars from the molasses to feed on. Eric, I believe last week you mentioned that uh, you had put some molasses in with your contest pepper plant. And, uh, you know, that certainly seemed to work out well. So, you know... In that context, we've kind of seen proof of concept. So that's kind of cool. I think, uh, you know, there's a couple people actually that I've been listening to in all these speeches and lectures that kind of go off about using sugars uh, and molasses to feed the fields. And it's, that is something I would never have thought of. I mean, it, it might have even been mentioned to me a few times on the Garden Channel, but it just seems so outrageous until you really kind of understand why and before i understood about the importance of the biology in the soil you know while i was still basically in the mindset of worms were the biology in the soil that mattered and as long as i was feeding the worms everything was good uh there's so much more to it than that right like the worms do their part and they definitely add their part but they're they are not the end all be all and uh, the only thing that you're really hoping for there so yeah, I, I would never have have thought that putting molasses or sugar into the garden was going to have a positive effect. Fascinating, fascinating. But, you know, it's just another example of uh, it really pays to be open minded and uh, just kind of listen to what people have to say. Maybe you're not going to agree with it, but at least you've listened to it. So you've had the opportunity to expose yourself to that perspective and. Maybe you've learned something. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you agree. Maybe you don't. It is what it is. That's uh, intellectual in conversation, right? I wonder if the sugars would work with aquaponics. Well, now that's interesting too, because aquaponics is all about the biology and those bacteria and stuff. And that's, you know, in theory, what you're trying to feed but I don't know how it would, would would work with the fish gills and stuff, you know. I would be a little bit afraid because of that. Mm. So if it were like maybe applied to the media bed, 
Okay, that's kind of where my only filtration is going on in my current aquaponic garden anyway. That might uh, that might not be a bad idea. Just a tiny bit, right? Just just a little bit to feed the sugars. Excuse me. I may have to check in and see if we have uh, any molasses downstairs. That might not be a bad idea. <clears throat> Worst case scenario, I lose some feeder fish. Best case scenario, I see a boost in growth in my plants and we grow the bacterial colony in my garden, which would be a good thing because it's clearly quite, quite minimal right now. In the beds, yeah, would be the way to go, would be the way to go. All right, well, let's see, back on to Mr. Action here, cover crops, relay crops. Now that's an interesting concept, a relay crops, one and then the other. I forget what he said the main crop was he does this with, but um, in one of his lectures, he mentions about growing alfalfa with, I think that might have been chickpeas as well. It's all about the chickpeas. Guy grows a lot of chickpeas, which is great. I like hummus and Shox uses chickpeas as like the main ingredient in her hummus. So fantastic, but hmm. Um, I don't think that's what it was though. Something, something. Is this clovers? Clovers? Clovers in amongst various things. Right, because when he cuts them down, the clovers got about a ton per acre of uh, living matter above the soil. So there's no space in between harvest and the growth of the cover crop. It just kind of, it's revealed as you bring down the, the main crop. And that's kind of interesting. It's uh, only got half the growing power that you had when it was growing with the crop and clover is being a legume that's going to feed the crop somewhat. So, I mean, that too probably has some interesting positive sort of effects, but it would be, I think, better if you can relay crops that are harvestable, edible, um, continuing to build revenue for your farm. And I mean, if you're uh, foraging animals on those, those acres, probably not too good for them to have a steady diet of clover. For some reason, he's trying to get away from brassicas, so don't know what's up with that. But there are a lot of different things that I imagine could be used kind of growing in between the lanes of the various crops. And one thing, too, Derek's been going off about is uh, spreading his rows a little bit wider and experiencing greater net returns in uh, dry matter production. That was interesting. And I think he said he got. 15% more actual uh, grain production out of that. So there are a few people that go off about spacing your plants a little bit farther apart will encourage them because the roots realize they've got more room and they can grow and the plant, you know, realizes it's got more room to stretch out and grow, catches more sunlight, yada, yada, yada. The logic is pretty, pretty sound, but um at the same time, you look at a natural growing grasslands field and there's no space there. Everything's crammed right in until it's, you know, up to the edge of the forest and then the trees are blocking it. So it's, there's pretty much nothing, you know, maybe a shrub, a little bush over here. But, you know, once you get into the trees, nothing. But out in the grasslands, packed. So that's a gray area too is that one of those uh, niche complementarity things niche niche complementarity things so you know in the grasslands the roots are all exploring different parts of the soil so it doesn't really matter that they're crammed and packed right on top of each other eh, who knows <clears throat> there are a lot of things that go along with this soil building thing that i don't think we humans will ever really figure out and uh, really just doing the best that we can with the time that we've got to build a little bit of soil on the land that we have available to us. It's not a bad mission, you know? Um, ultimately though, there's not too much to say about uh, Mr. Axton and, and basically his, his cropping ideas. 
if you've seen the the video, then Eric, you've you know you've got all the same stuff too. You're not really throwing any questions at me about uh, what he had to say. Not getting much activity going on in the feed. So I don't know what else there is to say about that. So I guess this is the part where we bust into any old question that YouTube won't necessarily ban me for. And or I wrap it up and get started on making dinner for when Shox gets home. So, yes, any other questions or uh, concerns, interests? Seen the guy you were talking about that grew 30 years of corn on a plant. Jason uh, Malk, M-A-U something. He's a fascinating lecture, isn't it? It's part of what I'm going to be getting going with, uh, with the Lonely Sisters garden there is just one of this, one of that, one of the other thing. Let them have all the room they want. And also part of why uh, in the Big Sisters Garden this year, I'm going to be spreading things out a whole lot more than I did last year. My corn was right on top of each other. You know, hearing what he has to say about those 30 cobs on one plant, you know, from one seed and thinking about uh, what I got out of my, you know, 200 and what was it, 206, 208 seeds that ended up planted in that garden. That's just like, man, did I ever waste a lot of corn, waste a lot of time. That was kind of a tragedy. So, yeah, it's going to be really interesting to give that a go this year and see if I get better results. You know, even an average of one cob per stock would be a huge improvement for me. He's from Indiana. Yeah, I think that, that sounds about right. Is... Uh, so many of these individuals, you know, they're from all over the states, all over uh, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. It is truly fascinating, this global village that we, uh, we live in and the opportunities that we have to learn from people just everywhere. It is absolutely fantastic. But um, yeah, back to Jason there. Very interesting the way he's spacing things out and uh, he's got his kids very much involved in his farming practices and they seem to be getting very excited about it. So that's always good when the youngsters kind of get into it and get involved, have some fun. But can you imagine that? 30 cobs of corn, 30 cobs off one plant. That'd be crazy. Absolutely crazy. So I'm doing popcorn next year. <laughs> so I'll probably have a bumper crop because, you know, popcorn. All these years that I've been trying to grow the sweet corn and getting nothing out of it. But, you know, the one that lasts forever. Audrey, 98. Be happy. Well, I try and be happy. <laughs> Never seen it before. Well, I can't say that it's a standard practice. So probably a reason for it. But, I mean, what is that reason? Is that reason a good reason? Is that reason... You know, we grow corn 30 inches apart because that's how wide the horse was going down the row. Who knows? But I am definitely looking forward to playing with some of those ideas right here in my own garden um, to try and to learn what I can from that. So, yeah, it'll be interesting. It, it really will be interesting to see <laughs> if I can get any results out of it. You know, I had some very meager results in the garden. So that's another reason, too, that I think. I'm just more of a livestocky guy than a, than a crop farmer guy. It's like I know how much I struggle with pepper plants and tomato plants and all of these things that everybody all over the place just seems to be able to, oh, look, I've got a tree I harvested. You know, like people taking so much from these plants and I'm like uh, riddled with aphids and struggling. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go with livestock and grow myself some pasture. They can eat that. Everything's good. I can grow a lawn that much. That much I can do. So, yeah, I don't know. I think we're at uh, 29 minutes here, going on half an hour. I think I'm going to wrap it up fairly early tonight. We've got one more chat this year that I kind of want to do. And then I think we're going to take a bit of a holiday break and get back to it in January. Eric, right, I plant wide rows of corn, but they're close in the row because of the earthway planter i was looking at one of those earthway planters kind of interesting i guess you could like fill up holes if you wanted to space them a little bit further apart i've been uh i'm probably it's a stupid idea i suspect 
but I'm toying with the idea of getting a really long stick and then basically drilling a hole in it every 18 inches or two feet and using that to plant my corn just so that I know it's good distance apart in the row. And my row is, uh, you know, fairly straight ish. But at the same time, it's kind of not worth it for what I've got going for next year because there's going to be one corn over in the Lonely Sisters, and then maybe like 10, 12 of them in what was the pepper patch this year. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. So I got to tape some of the holes. Well, that would work, right? I mean, you're going to get your seed that's initially stuck in that tape. But uh, afterwards, you're going to get your, your larger spacing. So that would totally work. Yeah, we'll see um, what's going to come of anything, everything. Anyway, yeah, so tomorrow I am going to introduce yet another speaker who, Eric, I'm sure you are very familiar with, but he's one of the gentlemen that I feel is kind of putting this all together. So that'll be a good spot, I think, to pause for the holidays. And then, yeah, as I said, we'll get back to it in January. Same rotation. Thursdays for the uh, assignment of homework. Wednesdays, hopefully, for the discussion of what uh, everybody has learned and or seen from that. And by then, I should have camera things set up a little bit different here in the room. So I can set up for more of a lecture type situation for these Wednesday chats, just in case. Yeah, it, it uh, still doesn't get a lot of feedback. So I'm going to wrap it up for now. I will see you tomorrow here. I will see you Sunday on JT Bear, then back here on Wednesday, taking a holiday break. I strongly encourage everybody, as we're wrapping up this year, spend a little time with your families. Spend a little time doing the things that matter to you. Stop and take a little time to stop and think about what matters to you. And uh, whatever you do, just be the person who spreads a little more kindness out in the world and uh, puts a little more love out there. You know, the world, the world always needs more love. And if that is a seed that we as gardeners or farmers can plant and grow, then that is a good seed to grow. <laughs>